And we have two distinguished speakers with us, uh, the first being Alan Ebenstein, who is the author of um, this very important biography of Hayek, which I hope everyone will pick up a copy. It's a fascinating book. Uh, for those of you who know about Hayek, you'll learn a great deal more, uh, I guarantee you. Those of you who don't know much about it, you'll find it's a fascinating story of a man and the ideas of liberty. Our second speaker is Chuck Baird, our good friend. And Chuck is a professor of economics at California State University at Hayward. He's also director of the Smith Center, and we're quite pleased that the Smith Center is co-sponsoring tonight's program, as you can see uh, from the banner. Um, before I uh, move further, I wanted to mention that the Smith Center also sponsors events at Cal State Hayward primarily. Uh, the next event is going to be on May 30th with the syndicated columnist uh, Robert Novak. Many of you may know of him from uh, being a host of a number of programs on CNN. Uh, Chuck uh, has brought tickets. Any of you who like to buy tickets are welcome to do so, and I certainly encourage you to attend. I think it should be an excellent event. The tickets are only ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Students are three dollars. Wow. Students are three dollars. <laughs> I want to also thank um, Robert Mondavi Winery, who donated the wine that we enjoyed this evening. As well as the customer company, which uh, has kindly also been a sponsor of our series. For those of you who may be new to the Institute, uh, hopefully you picked up a packet when you registered. You'll find information in the packet about our program of public policy research, and publication. We produce many books. Uh, this is our quarterly journal called the Independent Review. Uh, and you'll find information about many other projects of the Institute. In the packet, you'll find a flyer, uh, which is about tonight's program. And on the bottom of the front of the flyer, you'll find also information about uh, two of the upcoming events. I also wanted to point out that you'll find information about uh, our program plus an extensive archive of research studies and other publications on our website at independent.org as well as up-to-date information on events and other activities. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out is the event that we held here in March with John McWhorter, who's from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he spoke on the topic, Losing the Race, based on his new book. Um, Black Progress, Freedom, Independence. Um, the program is going to be rebroadcast on C-SPAN 2 this Saturday evening at 6.45 p.m. The upcoming events, which are on this flyer I mentioned that we're going to be holding, the next one is on July 5th. The subject of that program is why are the public schools failing and what can be done? The speakers will include John Merrifield, who is professor of economics at the University of Texas at San Antonio, and author of the new book, The School Choice Wars, and Richard Vetter, who's a senior fellow here and also professor of economics at Ohio University, and he's author of a new monograph of ours called Can Teachers Own Their Own Schools? On August 14th, we'll also be hosting Larry Elder, uh, who many of you know is a very popular talk show host in Los Angeles at KABC, and also is host of a program uh, I believe it's called Moral Court on Warner Brothers Television. And this fall, probably in September, we don't have it nailed down yet, but probably in September we'll be hosting Thomas Zaz, who will be speaking on his new book called Pharmacracy, uh, of which there's an excerpt uh, in this new issue of the Independent Review. In your packet, uh, one last thing I wanted to point out is each summer we host a series of, of summer seminars for high school and undergraduate college students called the Summer Seminars in Political Economy. And this year we'll be holding them once again. Uh, they're one week programs, Monday through Friday, um, 8.30 to 12.30. They're conducted by the economist Joseph Furick from Golden Gate University and the University of San Francisco. This year the program will be co-sponsored by Holy Names College here in Oakland. And for those students who are from out of town, we have accommodations at Holy Names at an incredible bargain. Uh, also, Holy Names is offering a one-hour college course credit in economics for those students who complete the program. So I think that anyone who's interested in having students 
receive really, I think, a life-changing experience in understanding the world they live in, uh, this is a program that we hope that you will have them participate in. Um, Which dates are those? Uh, the exact dates are July 7 to 13 and August 13 to 17. This evening, we're here to discuss the life and ideas of the eminent economist and political philosopher Friedrich A. Hayek. For myself, I hold a special reverence for Hayek and his work. Uh, in my case, years ago when I was a young man in the Air Force in Louisiana, <clears throat> I managed to first stumble across Hayek's work. Uh, in my instance, in order to overcome what I thought was a grinding boredom and uh, incompetence that I found when I was living in the Air Force, I was going through the stacks, the book stacks in the base library one day, and I happened to stumble across a book, and I opened the book up, and there's a chapter in it, the chapter was entitled, Why I Am Not a Conservative. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was rather provocative, and uh, the book happened to be The Constitution of Liberty by Hayek. Now, this was during the anti-war period of the Vietnam War, and one of the things that struck me about this chapter was how, in some respects, what Hayek was saying in a rather more eloquent way was somewhat reminiscent of what I was seeing in the news almost daily about the anti-war movement and their view of the government. At the same time, it also reminded me of some of the speeches of Barry Goldwater, which at that time was just about five or six years earlier when he ran for president. So it intrigued me. It seemed like there were two different wings of um, popular political culture that were sort of discussing something along the lines of what he was saying. So I read the entire book. I then ordered through the base library books, any book that he referenced essentially in that book. And that led me to von Mises and Friedman and many others. Um, Hayek's point in his chapter, in case you're interested, um, why I'm not a conservative, was that he was indeed not a conservative. He was a liberal in the true classical sense of the word. He was interested in liberty. And the way he described it, he was a Whig. He was not going to ally himself with any of the parties then. In fact, as many of you may know, his book, The Road to Serfdom, is dedicated to the socialists of all parties. Um, he was, in his view, he was not interested in conserving what governments did. Uh, he was interested in uh, conserving ideas or advancing understanding of ideas of civil society and he viewed political institutions as prim being the primary way to undermine these, these civil institutions, institutions based on individual choice and action, and the accumulated ideas, traditions, and consensual rules uh, going back to antiquity. And as a result, he was, being from Austria, he was firmly against what Europeans viewed as conservative, which was people who, who believed in defending, or in some respects were simply apologists, for what was uh, the stagnation, oppression, and outright human misery of pre-industrial societies under the caste and, caste and government privilege of feudal monarchies. The thing that also struck me about Hayek and uh, the new and incredibly rich literature that I had just happened to accidentally discover was that it was largely unknown. It was largely unknown to any of the people I knew uh, and I had already been to a number of colleges, uh, and I just could not find it having much of any sort of impact. And even in those circles in which they talked about free markets, they would talk about free markets on the one hand, on the other hand, they needed something that would be the opposite. So it intrigued me, and in no small way, that fateful day led to uh, the establishment of the Independent Institute. So Hayek has had a profound impact on the very existence of this institution that we're delighted that you're joining with us tonight. Our first speaker tonight is Alan Ebenstein. Alan is the Director of Research at the Arthur Roop Foundation. He received his PhD in Political Philosophy from the London School of Economics and Political Science. He's been a fellow at the Hoover Institution, and he has taught at Santa Barbara City College and Antioch University in Santa Barbara. As most of you know, Alan is the author of this book I mentioned, while the acclaimed book, Friedrich Hayek, a biography. In addition to his biography of Hayek, he's also the author of a number of books, including the book Today's Isms, with his fa late father, William Ebenstein and Edwin Fogelman, 
Introduction to Political Thinkers, also with his late father. Great Political Thinkers, Plato to the Present. Collected Works of Edwin Cannon and the Greatest Happiness Principle, an Examination of Utilitarianism. Alan has been a member of the Santa Barbara Board of Education, I should mention also, for eight years, and he's been a former candidate of the California State Assembly. I'm very pleased to introduce Alan to discuss his book. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to be able to talk to you on Hayek tonight. I think that of the think tanks and institutes in the United States that the Independent Institute is as close to Hayek's thought as any. This talk tonight will largely consist of a biographical presentation of Hayek's views, together with thoughts on the relationship between Hayek's views and modern American social conservatism. In addition, we are fortunate to have Professor Chuck Baird as a commenter. Hayek emerged from the milieu of Austrian liberalism during the last decades of the 19th century and first decades of the 20th. Signal among those who most influenced him were Karl Menger, founder of the Austrian School of Economics, and Ludwig von Mises, the key initiator of the socialist calculation debate. Both Menger and Mises were staunch liberals in the 19th, or perhaps independent institute, meaning of the term. Hayek's main professor at the University of Vienna, Friedrich von Wieser, was more of a welfare state interventionist. The conditions in Vienna following World War I, when Hayek became a student at the university, were grievous. Inflation was out of control, the economy collapsed, the traditional social order had been ripped asunder, a completely new society was in the making. And for this reason, it's unsurprising that as a young student at the University of Vienna during the late teens and early 20s, that Hayek for a time adopted mildly socialist outlooks. He was experiencing and thought he would participate in the rational construction of a new society. He, however, he then came in, into contact with Ludwig von Mises and his, and his views then changed. Hayek liked to describe his first meeting with Mises rather humorously. He came to Mises in 1921 with a letter of introduction, introduction from Wieser, who described him as, quote, a promising economist. Quote, promising economist, Mises asked. I've never seen you at any of my lectures. <laughs> Mises was a short, burly man given to occasional temperamental outbursts. He possessed a clear intellect, however, and Hayek learned much from him. The work of Mises that most influenced Hayek was Mises' socialism, which made the argument not that socialism would be ethically or morally undesirable, but that it literally does not deliver the goods. Mises' accomplishment was to turn the question of socialism from an ethical to a practical one. Not would socialism be desirable, but how would it work? So effective was Mises' argument that even many socialists admitted its power. Oscar Lange, a prominent Polish socialist, went so far as to say that, quote, a statue of Professor Mises ought to occupy an honorable place in the great hall of the Ministry of Socialization of the Socialist State. <laughs> Quite a, quite a statement. In 1931, after 10 years of working for and with Mises, Hayek went to the London School of Economics and Political Science, and it was here that his career blossomed and he gained worldwide renown. Probably the most famous name now associated with the London School of Economics during this period is Harold Lasky, and in considerable part, as a result of Lasky's influence, the LSE, as it is also known, gained a reputation as a haven for socialist thought. But there was another tradition at the London School of Economics which can be traced to its first professor of economics there, Edwin Cannon, one of the greatest scholars of Adam Smith and a classical liberal in his own right. There was much in Cannon's thought that Hayek found congruent with his own, emphasis on the slow, gradual transformation of societies and institutions. And I think this is one of the really core Hayekian ideas, is that institutions and societies are not planned, they cannot be directed in advance, rather they have to be allowed to emerge. And this was an idea that was in Cannon's thought um, and in, as well, this process, which Hayek turned spontaneous order, is also a concept that he found in the work of Karl Menger. 
Hayek's first work at the London School of Economics was as an economist. He was brought to LSE by the then leading English classical liberal Lionel Robbins, who was a student and successor of, of Edwin Cannon. Robbins was almost exactly the same age as Hayek, and together at the London School during the 1930s, Robbins and Hayek led a seminar that included many of the emerging leading lights in economics of the day. It uh, had no less than four future Nobel laureates in the same center, uh, seminar, in addition to Hayek, John Hicks, Arthur Lewis, and Ronald Coase. Uh, Arthur Selden of, of England also participated in the uh, in the seminar, and, and on the other side, John Kenneth Galbraith was a visiting, was a visiting student in, in Hayek's seminar for a year. Hayek was brought to the London School primarily as an opponent to John Maynard Keynes, who had just published in 1930 a treatise on money. Hayek wrote a blistering review of Keynes' treatise that was published simultaneously with his arrival in London. Keynes then wrote an even more blistering reply to Hayek's review article. This is what Keynes said, <clears throat> quote, Dr. Hayek's prices and production seems to me to be one of the most frightful muddles I have ever read. It is an extraordinary example of how, starting with a mistake, a remorseless lo logician can end up in bedlam. So, <clears throat> notwithstanding this rather inauspicious start, personal relations between Keynes and Hayek soon became good, though they never did agree on economics, and, ind and indeed seemed to have agreed not to discuss it. During... During World War II, Hayek became fairly close to Keynes when the London School of Economics moved to Cambridge, where Keynes resided. And it's actually the case that during the war, Hayek and Keynes would sometimes take turns tonight, uh, take turns at night watching for fires from the top of King's College in Cambridge. So they had a close personal relationship, although they did not agree professionally. Hayek's great accomplishment during the 1930s was to enunciate the idea of the division of knowledge which many Hayek commentators consider to be his greatest intellectual achievement. This idea of the division of knowledge occurred to Hayek as he was reflecting on the social, socialist calculation debate in which Mises, Mises had been involved 10 to 15 years earlier. There are many socialists, Mises had written, who have never come to grips with the problems of economics. They have criticized freely enough the economic structure of free society, but have consistently neglected to apply to the economics of the disputed state the same caustic acumen. They invariably explain how, in the cloud cuckoo lands of their fancy, roast pigeons will in some way fly into the mouths of the comrades, but they admit to show how this miracle is to take place. How would a socialist society practically be organized? It is not enough merely to point to deficiencies under capitalism. Hayek's brilliant insight is that there is a division of knowledge among all of the members of a society. Knowledge does not exist anywhere in a compact, complete whole. Rather, knowledge is fragmented. It exists in the minds of all of the members of a society. And I think this is really a core Hayekian, Hayekian idea. Um, words like epistemology and methodology are <clears throat> sometimes um, somewhat esoteric, but I, I think the idea is that um, how is it the case that you form a society when everyone's experience is individual? What sort of society is going to be the most effective to, to accommodate divided knowledge, knowledge that's divided among the minds of, of all the people in a society? Hayek's idea of the division of knowledge is very simple, but it is an idea that has potentially profound consequences. Hayek thought that the division of knowledge precludes the possibility of classical socialism, of the central management and direction of a nation's economy from one place. The division of knowledge, he thought, requires capitalism only under a system, whatever its other flaws, in which the reality of divided knowledge is accommodated is a materially productive society possible, Hayek believed. Hayek described the essay in which he put forward the idea of the division of knowledge, economics and knowledge, as the most important of his career. Later in his life, he sometimes said that he had made one discovery. This discovery was of the division of knowledge and its consequences. If knowledge is divided, how is information communicated? Hayek's answer here, too, is brilliant. Hayek believed that the, price, the, the profit and price system, capitalism, is primarily a system that conveys information. Prices and profits are information. Prices reflect the relative supply of and demand for different goods. 
Mises uses as an excellent example of how a building would be built under a socialist system to demonstrate the importance of prices. What type of wood should be used? Should bri bricks or concrete or steel be used in construction? What should the relatives, relative amounts of labor and capital that go in const into construction be? Without a price system, none of these questions can be answered in the most cost-effective and rational manner. Capitalism, through utilizing prices and profits, has been literally the only system that can deliver goods in an advanced technological society. And I think that's really the core question, is how is information about the relative amounts of goods and services to be communicated? Communicated? How do you know whether you should make a building out of wood or out of steel or out of concrete? And it's the price and profit system in capitalism that conveys that information. Prices are dependent on private property unless individuals have exclusive control over property and the ability to exchange it on the terms that they see fit. Prices are impossible. This is the problem. This was the problem in the Soviet Union and in other command economies during the 20th century. With no private property, there is no price. And without private properties, there cannot be rational economic calculation. Moreover, profits are as, are, as, are as essential to as prices to a capitalist order. Later in his career, Hayek further explored the concept of order without orderers or spontaneous order. The role of the business person who makes profits is essential to the capitalist order. Who is the best person to be entrusted with resources? In capitalism, this question is ideally answered by the individuals who make the most prices. That is, the individuals who use resources most effectively. Profits and prices convey inf information. They are essential, Hayek thought, to a free market order. And along these lines, I think it's <clears throat> crucial in evaluating the role of the entrepreneur is that the ability to make prices, ability to make profits, is not necessarily something that people can tell you how they did it. All you know is that somehow they're able to uh, conduct effective enterprises and con conduct effective businesses. And that's one of the great strengths of capitalism is that it's not the case that in advance, in the same way of trying to plan out a society or to try to plan out an economy, that you can verbally say before how you're going to make the price, all you, how you're going to make the profit. All you know is that in a capitalist system, the people who are the most experienced, the most uh, effective in making profits through experience are the individuals who will have more resources. Whereas in a command system, there is no other information conveying device like that. Who is the most effective with resources is, is as much a question as, as anything else. World War II, of course, affected events in England as the rest of the world greatly and, and focused Hayek's attention on the political ramifications of, of socialism. In his most well-known work, The Road to Serfdom, published during World War II in England, he now argued not only that socialism is unproductive, he argued that socialism is necessarily undemocratic and dictatorial. Unless there's economic freedom, there cannot be political freedom. This is really the crux of the matter, he wrote in The Road to Serfdom. Whoever controls all economic activity controls the means for all our ends. Economic control is not merely control of a sector of human life which can be separated from the rest. The control of the production of wealth is the control of human life itself. And this sounds now commonplace, but at the time there were many who believed that the problems of command collectivist economies wasn't that they owned all of the nation's goods and services, but that they were undemocratic and that somehow there could be a democratic socialism. But Hayek argued profoundly that there can be no political liberty without economic liberty. The Road to Serfdom was a great success, and Hayek made a lecture tour uh, to the United States in the spring of 1945, just as World War II was ending. He visited the University of Chicago, and later, between 1950 and 1962, he was on the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago, and he came in mind with such figures as Milton Friedman, uh, George Stiegler, both future Nobel laureates at the, at the University of Chicago. It's interesting to consider the relationship between Friedman and, and Hayek. They're often considered to be the two greatest philosophers or economists of a free market order during the 20th century. And they were not as close, uh, not quite as close personally and intellectually as somewhat as is sometimes thought. 
Um, in terms of their technical economics, while they were both uh, free marketeers, they had substantially different ideas of how money works in the economy. And uh, I must admit that my own presentation is much closer to Milton Friedman's than it is to Friedrich Hayek's in terms of how money in the economy works. And I believe that Professor Baird will mention a thing or two about that. <laughs> the, um, having fortunately seen his uh, comments before, uh, I'm, I'm covering myself at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so watch for that. The, um, <clears throat> however, in terms of notwithstanding their technical, their technical disagreements, they both agreed strongly that a free market is, is, is the best system. And um, I think Hayek was much more of a philosopher, someone who put forward broad general ideas, whereas Friedman is much more of an economist, someone who is, uh, has a more uh, grounded empirical approach. Another great mind with whom Hayek was in contact during these years was the philosopher Karl Popper, like Hayek from Vienna, and also like Hayek who wound up teaching at the London School of Economics. <clears throat> the great work of Hayek's Chicago period was the Constitution of Liberty. Here he attempted to expand some of the ideas of the division of knowledge that he had developed in economic theory and apply them to all of societal life. In the area of economics, Hayek argued that because knowledge is divided, societies should be able to accommodate divided knowledge in their economic systems, and that economic systems that do not accommodate, accommodate divided knowledge are necessarily going to be unproductive economic systems. Hayek now attempted to take this idea of the division of knowledge and apply it to all of, of human life. And his idea was that liberty, and this was his, his great concept, all, his later works, his two great later works, The Constitution of Liberty and Law, Legislation, and Liberty, particularly in the second, The Constitution of Liberty, Law, Legislation, and Liberty, draw attention in their titles to the idea that there is a connection, an intrinsic connection between law and a society and liberty. There cannot be a free society unless people know what the rules in a society are and are able to interact with one another in a way that they can foresee what the consequences of their actions will be. Hayek believed that liberty is the supremacy of law. To some, this may sound a very distinct conception of liberty, because liberty during the 20th century was more often considered to be either the absence of law, constraints, or a certain material standard of liberty, of living. How can liberty be the supremacy of law? Following from his work in the division of knowledge, Hayek postulated that it is law, rules, that allow people to interact more or less effectively. The better or worse laws or rules in a society are, the more or less effectively individuals will interact. The rules that Hayek saw as crucial to a materially productive society are the rules that sustain and create a free market. Private property, contract, profit, freely fluctuating prices, a stable currency, limited government intrusion in and involvement with individuals' lives. Hayek had two great works in him after the Constitution of Liberty was published in 1960. In 1962, he and his second wife moved back to Europe, to Freiburg, and then West Germany. Primarily here, Hayek wrote Law, Legislation, and Liberty, which because of illness was not published until the 1970s. In Law, Legislation, and Liberty, Hayek explored further the relationship between liberty and law. Particularly in its crucial first volume, Rules and Order, he developed the insights that had guided him throughout his earlier career. He expanded the idea of law to not just the legal status statutes of a society, but its customs and morals. Hayek was appalled by the protests and re revolts among the young during the 1960s. He feared that socialism and in idea and practice would triumph over the free market particularly as inflation ignited throughout the Western world during the late 1960s and early 70s, as the American position in the world diminished, and as the influence of the Soviet Union expanded, he feared that the prospects for freedom were as imperiled as they had been at any time since World War II. In 1974, most unexpectedly, he was co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences with so Swedish socialist Gunnar Meyerdahl. <laughs> When, when Friedman wrote his uh, congratulatory note to Hayek after, after, after receiving the, the Nobel, he said that, uh, he said that uh, dear Fritz, I'm, I'm, I regret that it's taken this long for the 
the Swedes to award you the Nobel, and even then they went only half the way. But uh, he was nonetheless happy that Hayek had received the award. A Nobel Prize in Economics had only been instituted in 1969. Hayek was the first free market economist to receive the, the reward, and this was the great rejuvenating event for him. Um, it was said at the time that the Swedes really wanted to give the award just to Gunnar Meyerdahl, but they felt they would be subjected to criticism for giving the award to someone so far on the left, so they joined Hayek with Meyerdahl, right with left, to be able to create more balance in the presentation of the award. As a result of receiving the Nobel Prize in Economics, Hayek became not merely the best-selling author of a popular work three decades before, but the first free market economist to win a Nobel. As a result of the greater prominence that the Nobel Prize garnered him, he was once again referred to in the popular press, particularly in England. Hayek's greatest later renown was in England, particularly during the 1980s. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher adopted him as her leading philosophical inspirer, and the uh, renown of Hayek in Great Britain is uh, as high as it is in the United States. It's much, much higher, much higher in England than it is here. During the late 1970s and all through the 80s, and Hayek was always a fundamentally British individual in the sense that he lived there for 20 years, his, his children were raised there and still reside there. He identified most with many English ideas. He was really part of the great stream of English classical liberalism and political philosophy, or political co economy perhaps is distinct from technical economics. During the late 1970s and through the 1980s, particularly during the time of the Thatcher government in Great Britain and the Reagan administration in the United States, the idea began to emerge that Hayek was not just a great political thinker for a point in time, but a great political thinker for all time. His contributions in the area of the division of knowledge, of the essential role of prices, profits, private property, and contract to a market order, and of the relationship among liberty, law, customs, and morals began to be recognized as permanent contributions to Western political order and thought. He had been right about Keynes and the welfare state all along, and now with the decline of communism and socialism throughout the world during the 1980s, he, be, he came to be recognized as the great anti-socialist, the thinker who enunciated the contours of a new free, free market order in the same way that Marx philosophically enunciated the idea of a communist system during the 19th century. Hayek's final work was The Fatal Conceit. In 1978, he conceived the idea of organizing a debate on the question, was socialism a mistake? As earlier and elsewhere during his career, Hayek attempted to move a question from the realm of ethics to that of facts. He sought to organize teams on both sides of the proposed debate topic for a great public discussion in Paris. This proposed debate did not come off. However, Hayek wrote a book that was originally intended to be a challenge to debate, The Fatal Conceit, subtitled The Errors of Socialism, in which he attempted to bring his life's work to a conclusion. The insight that he originally developed through the socialist calculation debate, that knowledge is divided and that, that pri prices and profits guide production, he now attempted to apply to societies as, uh, as wholes and their entire complexes of rules, laws, customs, morals, and manners. Now, Hayek argued, there is essentially a Darwinian struggle among different societies and their their laws, their rules, broadly understood, and that societies that have the most materially productive rules will be the societies that prevail in the end. After several years of illness, Hayek died in March 1992, less than two months shy of his 93rd birthday. Father Johannes Schasching said in his homily that Hayek was one looking for solutions to the great problems of mankind. He tried to find an answer. He was himself convinced that his answers were merely a piece within a larger mosaic. Though ill, Hayek was well aware, well aware that the Berlin Wall fell and that communism and the Soviet Union collapsed. These events have seemed to justify his life's purpose and message. Within the field of human society, there can be no freedom unless individuals possess substantial liberty to live their lives, including their material lives, substantially as they wish. As Hayek concluded the road to serfdom almost a half century before his demise, a policy of freedom for the individual is the only truly progressive policy. The idea that individuals may be made to be better than they are through compulsion is false. 
As Hayek said so well in the Constitution of Liberty, liberty is an opportunity for doing good. We praise or blame only when a person has the opportunity to choose. Near the end of the road to serfdom, he said along this same line on the proper field of morals, individual conduct, that issues in this field have become so confused that it is necessary to go back to fundamentals. What our generation is in danger of forgetting is not only that morals are of necessity a phenomenon of individual conduct, but that they can exist only in the sphere in which the individual is free to decide for himself. The members of a society who in all respects are made to do the good thing have not title to praise. In order to be moral, individuals should have the opportunity to choose the right thing to do. Economist and political philosopher though he was, Hayek was also ultimately a moralist. His foundational assumptions included that if individuals are given freedom, they will choose to do the right things and that collectivist co coercion steals from human what makes us human, free will. Since the talk this night was uh, announced as Friedrich Hayek and the Future of Freedom, I'd like to uh, conclude with some thoughts um, on, that, are, that are partly extrapolation on Hayek's view of freedom in the circumstances of the present political and economic uh, or societal situation in the United States. Hayek was more a philosopher and philosophical economist than a practical policy advisor, and it is the case that his practical policy suggestions have often been criticized by individuals who thought that they have conceded too much to uh, welfare state liberalism, uh, that although he philosophically enunciated ideas for freedom, nonetheless he would, in his practical advice, allow a reasonable role for government, and to some extent that may be a product of the times in which he wrote, given that governmental ideas were uh, so prominent during the idea, the idea of larger government was so prominent during the 20th century, it was perhaps inevitable that his thought would be tainted in that way. Following a conversation with David Thoreau, um, I'd, I'd like to offer these thoughts on Hayek. Hayek concluded the postscript of the Constitution of Liberty with an essay titled, Why I Am Not a Conservative. And it is undoubtedly the case that Hayek was not a conservative in the European sense of one who favored strong governmental control. Indeed, he noted in Why I Am Not a Conservative that both traditional European conservatives and socialists had more in common with each other than either shares with the classical liberal position of freedom. At the same time, as earlier mentioned, Hayek was appalled by the student riots and protests of the 1960s and of the general counter-cultural movement during this time, though he did not believe that government should prescribe or proscribe certain ethics. However, he was greatly disappointed by the change in societal ethics during the 1960s and 70s. And um, in some of his last essays, he spoke of the importance of the family to class, uh, capitalist societies. I believe that there is a fundamental alliance between Hayekian liberalism and, and social conservatism. And this would be based on the idea that if people are given freedom, they will choose conservative social values. The problem with government in our time is that it encourages values that are antithetical to enabling strong communities based on traditional values and morals to emerge. The, the essence of the Hayeking position is that people should, in freedom, have the opportunity to lead, lead the lives and choose the communities in which they desire to live. One Hayeking scholar, Jeremy Shimmer, has written of optimal Hayeking society as consisting of competing, competing communities, communities that would have variegated lifestyles and societal patterns. Individuals would then have the choice to live in the communities which they desired. This is an attractive ideal. The idea of societal diversity is, from a Hayekian perspective, not adequately understood. Diversity is not just in societies and institutions, but of societies and, and institutions. A recent example will provide a case in point. There's an institute or there's an entity called WASC, which is the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, through which all colleges and institutions have to be accredited. <clears throat> And there were questions regarding diversity issues at a small private college, Thomas Aquinas College, as to whether they would be accredited by WASC as a result of the morals, 
uh, and ethical principles which they wanted their students and faculty to uphold. Uh, and it's very important for students to be accredited, as colleges to be accredited, because if colleges aren't accredited, then students aren't able to receive guaranteed student loans and that sort of thing. So it's, it's, a, it's a real practical issue. And I think that the Hayekian idea of, of diversity is not that every single university in the United States is going to be a carbon copy of each other. There can be diversity of institutions as well as diversity in institutions. And the problem in our society today is that we focus almost exclusively on diversity in institutions and not diversity of institutions. There's another idea of diversity, and I think that Hayek's idea is in, entirely congruent with that other idea. Let's see here. I think that Hayek's position would not be that state-sanctioned imposition of universal uh, policy codes of any sort are the appropriate way to go. Rather, there should be the greatest diversification and diversity of societies and institutionals, institutions possible. This, this example, moreover, has broader societal implications. Over 100 years ago, John Stuart Mill wrote in On Liberty of the increasing, people, increasing tendency of people to read the same things, speak the same things, hear the same things, and suggested that liberty of thought and expression is the essence of a genuinely free and libertarian society. American society today is in many respects much the same as Mill described it over 100 years ago as politically correct speech codes on college campuses attest, there are great limits on what can be expressed and thought in American society today. As in Mill's time, individuals with views contrary to those sanctioned by the majority, or perhaps even merely an empowered elite minority, may express their views only using extreme care. The idea of re reducing the power of government all around is consistent with the practice of diverse communities within themselves and among themselves, and of genuinely free intellectual inquiry and thought. One of the things that most interested me in researching Friedrich Hayek, a biography, were lecture notes of, of Hayek that he, that he gave uh, while he was on the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago, where he emphasized the absolute importance and centrality of freedom of thought, expression, and discussion to a free and libertarian society. From a practical perspective, Hayek's ideas point in the direction of local governance rather than centralized governments, and of private and voluntary provision of social services and activities than of state-mandated ones. In the same way that government cannot centrally manage provision of a nation's welfare services, at least not optimally, Excuse me. In the same way that government cannot centrally manage a nation's economy, neither may government be able centrally to manage provision of a nation's welfare services, at least optimally, which social policy during recent decades seems to suggest. The Hayekian, Hayekian idea of community is in many ways similar to that of a socially conservative one, of free and moral individuals who choose and create the communities in which they live. Too often, government is a hindrance toward the creation of these sorts of communities as government attempts to manage all of a nation's economy were. Perhaps the next step in the Hayekian public policy program should be to turn the insights that he developed in his critique of socialism, that government attempts to manage all of a nation's economy are invariably inefficient, to turn this insight to the idea that government attempts to manage all of the nation's moral and ethical practices are equally inefficient. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Our next speaker is uh, our dear friend, Chuck Baird, who, as I mentioned before, is professor of economics and co-chairman of the economics department at California State University and director of the Smith Center for Private Enterprise. He received his PhD in economics from the University of California, Berkeley. He's been a Woodrow Wilson Fellow and a Danforth Fellow. He's taught at UCLA, Stanford, and the, and the University of the Witwatersrand. Witwatersrand. <laughs> Professor, Professor Baird is a member of the board of directors also of the Mount Pelerin Society, which is founded by F.A. Hayek in 1947. 
He's a quarterly columnist for the magazine Ideas on Liberty. He serves on the editorial boards of three academic journals and is consultant on labor economics to the New Zealand Business Roundtable. He's the author of four textbooks, including Prices and Markets, Macroeconomics, Elements of Macroeconomics, and Elements of Microeconomics, as well as numerous monographs, including ones on advertising, unionism, rent control, and other areas. His articles have appeared in uh, so many journals and, and magazines, I, I couldn't count them all. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to introduce Chuck Baird. Thank you, David. Before I begin my remarks, I want to do one little uh, commercial. Upstairs at the Smith Center table up there, there is this uh, brochure that describes a program that we're doing in June. This actually supplements and complements what David's doing here at the Independent uh, Institute. We have a program for teachers, including home teachers, uh, on how to use Socratic seminars uh, as an education tool. And this is free to teachers. And it is from June 25th to June 29th. And you can pick up these brochures upstairs. And if, you're, if you are teachers, please look at them. And if you know teachers, please pass them on. Now, uh, to my remarks here. I'd like to begin with a, a little anecdote uh, uh, from my own experience with Hayek. I met Hayek in 1977 when the Institute for Humane Studies, which now is in, uh, at George Mason University, but then was in um, Menlo Park, was it Menlo Park? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Menlo Park, uh, put on a two-week conference on Austrian economics at Mills College here in Oakland. Now, I was the director of that program, uh, which, which overstates my significance, because in effect, that just meant that I was the gopher. Uh, I was the one who was supposed to make all of the pieces fit together. And one of the pieces that I was responsible for was to pick up Hayek from Berkeley, which I find astonishing. I don't know what they would do with Hayek at Berkeley. <laughs> Remember, I got my PhD from Berkeley, and it's not Hayek friendly up there. <laughs> but anyway, I picked him up from uh, Berkeley and drove him down to Mills College in my 1972 Volkswagen Beetle. I washed it that afternoon before I picked him up. Now, I was very nervous about this because, uh, first of all, a Volkswagen Beetle didn't seem appropriate for such an august person, but also because uh, I didn't want to go down in history as the one who was responsible for the accident in which Nobel laureate F.A. Hayek died, right? <laughs> well, in any case, I picked him up, I introduced myself to him, gave him my card, and we started the short journey down to Mills College. He was, he's just a charming man. He quickly put me at ease, and he asked me about what sort of work I was doing in economics, and he actually seemed interested in my answers. Uh, not all people are, uh, <laughs> except my students, of course. Um, now, we arrived safely uh, at uh, Mills College, and I escorted him to where he was to give his presentation, and the presentation went very well. Now, the next morning, uh, I reintroduced myself to him and offered him another card. Now, that was a huge mistake. <laughs> See, my thinking, my thinking was that, well, you know, I'm just kind of a background person, I'm just kind of a gopher, and I'm not sure he would remember me. But, of course, when I offered him my card for the second time, he misinterpreted that to, th to say that I was suggesting that probably he didn't have a good memory. <laughs> and he bristled. And he said, young man, I remember who you are. <clears throat> then he paused, tried to look severe, and then he smiled. And he said, I am surprised that one as young as you has trouble remembering what he did on the day before. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> that's, that's the Hayek that I knew. I was at ease from, from that moment on. And there's a little, uh, a tale, uh, a little ending to this story. In 1982, there was a general meeting of the Montpellier Society in Berlin, which I attended actually under the auspices of David Thoreau here, who at that time was uh, president of the Pacific Institute, which is now called the Pacific Research Institute in San Francisco. And I, I came across Hayek in the course of the evening of the opening banquet. Every 
Mount Palin Society meeting has an opening bank, but of course everybody has name tags on. So I approached him and before I said anything, he said to me, now mind you, the Mills College experience was 1977. This is 1982. He looked at my name tag, gave it an expression of recognition and he said, Mr. Baird, I hope your memory has improved since our days together at Mills College, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> he's a great guy, he's a great guy. Now there's another uh, anecdote that I'd like to tell. This is not about my experience with Hayek, and, and uh, actually I found out tonight from Alan that this is in the, bi I didn't think it was in the biography, it's in the biography in a footnote, and I must confess, I read the biography, but I didn't read the footnotes. This, this, this book is put together very well, the footnotes are all at the end, uh, so you don't have to uh, be bothered with them, and I confess that I wasn't. <laughs> so. But anyway, I heard this anecdote from Mike Walker, who is the president of the Fraser Institute in Canada. As Alan says in his uh, biography, in 1984, Hayek was made a companion of honor by Queen Elizabeth. And in his audience with Queen Elizabeth, now, we've got to put this in historical context, because at this time, the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, and various offshoot organizations were uh, very much involved in making London a hazardous place to be. Uh, so the Queen, in this audience, uh, asked uh, Hayek, how to pronounce his name. Was it Hayek or was it Hayek? And he said, it's Hayek, like high explosives. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Well, I've been asked to comment on the significance of the economics of Hayek in the present and future struggle to preserve liberty. And I have two... Uh, two newspaper articles that, I, that, that are very recent, which illustrates that uh, a lot of people in this world could benefit from a reading of Hayek. First, from the ANG newspapers, the Alameda Newspaper Group newspapers, on Sunday, May 6th this year, there was a story that said, this headline, National Labs Disagree with Bush on Energy. And it says, Scientists at the country's national laboratories have projected enormous energy savings if the government takes aggressive steps to encourage energy conservation in homes, factories, offices, appliances, cars, and power plants. <laughs> Imagine that. Now, one of the most important uh, messages that, that, that people get from reading Hayek is that prices do things like that. Higher prices are precisely those things which get us to conserve voluntarily in the ways that are best for us and given our, the, our own circumstances of time and place. But the scientists in the country's national laboratories have not read Hayek. And then the same article, quote, a lengthy and detailed report based on three years of work by five national laboratories said that a government-led efficiency program <laughs> emphasizing, <laughs> emphasizing research and incentives to adopt new technologies could reduce the growth in electricity demand by between 20% and 47%. <laughs> well, now again, imagine that. That's another role of prices. A central theme of Hayek's economics is that prices convey information Prices tell us what the relative scarcities are. Prices tell users to use less, tell suppliers to try to supply more, tell entrepreneurs to get into markets where prices are high relative to cost, and entrepreneurs to get out of markets where, where prices are low relative to cost. But this lengthy and detailed report based on three years of work by five national laboratories didn't understand that. Now, the second article, uh, well, actually, it's the same paper. It's the second article, but it's the same paper on the same date, May, May 6th. This is a story about a, a man named Severin Borenstein, who was director of the University of California Energy Institute in Berkeley. And he, he was, uh, he's uh, generally portrayed as a genius in this area. 
But in this article, it says that he sees the need for federal regulators uh, to ensure that the market system treated consumers fairly. Now, it gets better. We didn't, we didn't just say, oh, the market will take care of everything and walk away. He's talking here, of course, about the California energy crisis, you know, in this third world state that we live in. Uh, <clears throat> Similarly, Bornstein now believes that there is a need for more stringent federal regulation of the electricity industry. He believes that power generators have been taking advantage of California's electricity shortage and boosting prices to astronomical levels. Still, he doesn't vilify the companies that own power plants. And here's the interesting thing. Listen to this. This is a quote from him, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Bornstein. Generators are out there to make as much money as they can, he says. That's how markets work. Our job is to design markets so that when they try to make as much money as they can, they end up doing things that are good for consumers. <laughs> now, anybody who has read Milton Friedman, F.A. Hayek, uh, von Mises, or Gary Becker, or even my books, <laughs> would understand that that's precisely what markets do. When people make money in free markets, they can only make it if they end up doing things that are good for their customers. Now, this is a statement by a person who's supposed to be a genius. At the director, he's the director of the University of California Energy Institute in Berkeley. You know, I often say that I have the best of both worlds. I have a Berkeley degree but I have a UCLA education. Okay. My first job was an assistant professor at, at, at UCLA, and I came under the very wholesome influence of Armin Elchin and the crowd down there. Great people. They're the ones that introduced me to the free market. It was at UCLA that I first got introduced uh, to, to Hayek. And uh, uh, unfortunately now, uh, UCLA, because Armin Elchin has retired, Harold Demsetz has retired, uh, several other good free market people have retired there. UCLA economics department has become but a, uh, a, a, a mere shadow uh, imitation of uh, the Berkeley uh, economics department, and that's really, a, in my opinion, a very sad, a sad uh, occasion. But anyway, uh, lack of understanding reigns supreme at uh, Berkeley, even as it was true when I was there. Now, I agree with Alan that the most important contribution of Hayek to economics is his principle of the division of knowledge, and also the related idea of competition as a discovery procedure. I want to differentiate, I want to take a little exception to, uh, to what Alan had to say about Mises and Hayek on the socialist calculation debate. I think that the, the two contributions there were, were really quite different. I mean, Mises started out the socialist calculation debate by pointing out that if you don't have markets, you can't have prices. And in particular, if you don't have markets for capital goods, uh, you, don't, you can't have prices, because prices are things that emerge in markets. Uh, and without prices, of course, the planners cannot calculate. They don't know where to build a building of cement or wood or steel or whatever, as, as Alan said. That was Mises' view. Hayek, of course, agreed with that, but he, he went beyond that. Hayek's contribution was to pay very careful attention to the, the process by which prices do coordinate uh, economic activities. He, and, and, in, and in so doing, he came to understand, uh, as Alan does suggest, he came to understand that, that price formation is, is, is inescapably uh, caught up in the subjectivity of uh, costs and benefits. So that when Abba Lerner, by the way, Abba Lerner was on my dissertation committee at uh, Berkeley. So when Abba Lerner and Oscar Lange uh, came up with the market socialist, uh, isn't that a contradiction in terms? Market socialist, yeah, that was a market socialist solution to the, to the challenge that Mises put out uh, in 1921, uh, where uh, there would be uh, 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 trying to find prices by trial and error, that is, uh, they, they appreciate, that's why Mises was supposed to get this, this statue in the Great Hall of Socialist Heroes, uh, because they came to understand that prices are important. While Longa and, uh, 
and, uh, and Lerner came up with this, uh, this model uh, by which uh, the planners would, would solve that problem very easily. They would simply cry out prices at random, right? Uh, that's actually going to Val Ross, but uh, that language. Cry out prices at, at, at random and then see, all right, is the price too low? We'll know if the price is too low because the amount wanted will be greater than the amount that's available. Then we'll raise prices. And if the price that we cry out is too high, we'll know that too because the amount available will be uh, greater than the amount that people want. And so we'll lower prices. The only trouble is, of course, that uh, in in uh, the market, as it actually functions, nobody is setting price. Well, there are price setters, but in, in the market, uh, there, there are all kinds of people trying all kinds of prices, but these, but these prices are based upon individual bits of knowledge. Here we go with the division of knowledge again. Individual bits of knowledge and understanding of uh, circumstances of time and place. And the other point to be made here, I'm going too fast, but that's okay, uh, is, is that uh, uh, is, the, is the question of incentives. Uh, uh, the, the role of, pr what prices do in a free market is because prices affect what is in the best interest of the individual decision makers. Within a socialist setting, uh, that uh, incentive effect uh, is, is absent. So Hayek, I think, went, went beyond Mises. He complimented Mises. He developed, the, he developed the role of prices more deeply than Mises did. Uh, in the socialist calculation debate. Uh, <clears throat> the division of knowledge idea began as an argument against central economic planning. It developed into a description of how prices and profits coordinate economic activities in free markets, and it gave rise to Hayek's understanding of the spontaneous order. Now we realize that the, that the idea of the division of, uh, the division of knowledge and spontaneous order has a lot to say about the regulatory practices of the mixed economy today. The watermelon crowd. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, well, it's, it's an expression that was actually coined, as far as I know, by the late Warren Brooks. <laughs> watermelon people. Green on the outside, pink on the inside, you know? Well, there is a, uh, <clears throat> there is a watermelon crowd, and actually, as I look at the at the political landscape in the United States today, it, it, it is environmentalism. Environmentalism that uh, is the biggest threat to our individual economic liberties. It is the environmental excuse that is, that is used uh, more often than any other excuse to, uh, to uh, justify uh, planning not for the whole economy, but planning in particular sectors of the economy, which is just as deadly, just as deadly. That, that is, a, <clears throat> that is a, uh, a contemporary use of the notion of the uh, division of knowledge and the impossibility of central economic planning. It's not just central economic planning like uh, they had with the Soviet uh, five-year plans, but it's actually central economic planning of even parts of the economy because the planners simply cannot know. Not because they're dumb, and not because they're bad people. They could be very good people, they can ver be very intelligent people, but the fact is that the necessary knowledge, uh, the, the knowledge that people have to have in order to make plans that work, in order to make plans that are consistent with reality, doesn't exist anywhere in its entirety. It's scattered out in bits and pieces. This is almost a direct quote from from uh, Hayek's um, 1945 piece, The Use of Knowledge in Society. It's scattered out there. And the only way that all of that relevant knowledge can be used is if everybody can play a part. And the only way that everybody can play a part is if we have a free economy. Now, <clears throat> Israel Kirzner, who is uh, another hero of mine, I also met Israel Kirzner at that 1977 Mills College uh, uh, <clears throat> seminar for the first time. Uh, Israel uh, is best known for his, uh, <clears throat> his work on uh, entrepreneurship. And he claims, in, ex in, a, in excessive modesty, he claims that everything that he has written is actually in Mises. 
Well, it isn't. I mean, a lot that Israel has done is, is original Israel Kersner, but a lot of what Kersner has done is also in Hayek, and it's not in Mises. One of the best pieces that Kersner has ever written, and by the way, uh, I'm very sad to say that Israel Kersner has announced that on January of 2002, he's retiring from the economics profession. Israel is, uh, Israel is uh, an orthodox rabbi, uh, and he has decided he's going to leave economics, going to retire from his professorship at the university, uh, at New York University, and devote uh, his full attention to his, uh, to his religious pursuits. Uh, I wish him well, but it's going to be a great loss to lovers of freedom. One of the best uh, pieces uh, that Kersner wrote uh, was a piece called uh, The Perils of Regulation, a Market Process Approach. And I can't take the time to go over the arguments there, but all of the points that he made, essentially there were four, there were four sections of that paper. One is what he called undiscovered discovery. That's based upon Hayek's competition as a discovery procedure. Unsimulated discovery, stifled discovery, superfluous discovery, all of that is Hayek. It's all Hayek. So Kersner owes a, a, a great debt to Hayek, which he acknowledges, notwithstanding that he insists that everything that he's written is really in Mises. Um, now, at a bare minimum, I think that every life-arranging politician of both parties, because the Republicans are not any better than the Democrats on this. It may be just a question of degree, and sometimes the Republicans are worse than the Democrats, but every life-arranging uh, politician of any political party, I believe, should have to prove that they have read and understand the following pieces. Economics and Knowledge, these are Hayek's pieces. Economics and Knowledge, 1937. This is where the idea of the uh, division of knowledge was first introduced. Followed up by the Use of Knowledge in Society, which was in 1945, and that was published in the American Economic Review, actually. And I think it was a September issue in 1945. Here's one that Alan doesn't mention, but I think is very important, and that's the confusion of language and political thought, which was written in 19, or published in 1967. And then uh, competition as a discovery procedure in 1968. The pretense of knowledge in 1974. That was his Nobel lecture. That, uh, you know, when people got the Nobel Prize, they, they, they get to talk. And, and uh, some, some people make more sense than others. And Hayek made a lot of sense in this piece, which has been published, uh, well, it's been published in many places. It's in one of his collection of papers called, I think, New Studies in Philosophy uh, and Economics. Or, and what is it? New Studies in Politics, Philosophy, and Economics. New, study in, new Studies in Politics, Philosophy, and Economics. Thank you. Uh, and uh, and, uh, uh, and it, after the pretense of knowledge, they should read his last book, The Fatal Conceit. I think all of these people should have to read these and demonstrate that they understand. They don't have to agree with it, just demonstrate that they understand what is said in there before they can take their oath of office. Yeah? Imagine, boy, that would be fun. Now, I would recommend that these same pieces, I mean, this is just my, an indication of how important I think Hayek is. I think these same pieces should be required reading in every school of journalism <laughs> and every school of law. Uh, at the very least, with respect to journalism, uh, an understanding of Hayek would, would, in, would permit these uh, journalists to understand perhaps uh, the right questions to ask of those, quote, madmen in authority uh, who know nothing of economics and seem to be proud of their ignorance. The fatal conceit, I think, uh, which, is, which is more about, rather than economics and how markets work, it's more about the evolution of societies. Uh, I think that gives great pause to all of those who would seek to redesign society in their own image. Now, David just gave me a, a note here to tell me to shut up. No, he, he, told, me, he told me I have uh, one more minute. And so I'm going to skip one section of what I had here, uh, actually two sections. I want to come to the last thing that I wanted to say. 
Um, <clears throat> I have one. I, enjoy, I enjoyed Alan's book immensely. I learned a lot of things about Hayek that I simply didn't know. Fascinating life. If you read that book, you will enjoy it. You will learn a lot. You'll learn a lot that's valuable. And I, and I, and I agree with almost all that Alan says. I have a little problem with the with the role of money, as he said I might talk about, but I'm going to skip over that because I don't have time. But I want to get to something that I think is really substantial, a, a disagreement I have with Alan. On page 199, uh, Alan tells us that Jefferson's statement in the Declaration of Independence that, quote, all men are created equal, unquote, is inconsistent with Hayek's case for inequality. The case for inequality uh, that Hayek makes in the Constitution of Liberty. I think that's just wrong. I think that's, that's a misreading of the situation. Uh, the, and I think the best way to see that is to go, to go to page 87 of the Constitution of Liberty. And let me close by just making this quote from Hayek. From the fact that people are very different it follows that if we treat them equally, the result must be inequality in their actual position, and that the only way to place them in an equal position would be to treat them differently. Equality before the law, which was what Jefferson was talking about in the Declaration of Independence, equality before the law and material equality are therefore not only different, but they are in conflict with each other, and I agree with Hayek on that, and I cordially disagree with Alan on that. Thank you very much. We have some time for some questions, and uh, Carl has the microphone, and if you'd wait, um, um, how about this gentleman right over here, Carl? Yeah. And um, if you uh, make it a short question and indicate who it's addressed to. Uh, this question is for both the panelists. Can you hear me all right? Yep. I have here in my hand a, a little write-up from Brand X. That would be the Hoover Institute. And we have lots of friends of the Hoover we, Institute. We do. <laughs> and I was very surprised. I, I'm, a, I'm a total free market here, like most people here. But I was very surprised to read, according to John Cassidy, uh, writing the New Yorker, that Hayek uh, supported, the idea was when the market, you know, in general, the market is the most efficient method of providing goods and services. When the market fails, however, the government should step in. And therefore, Hayek believed in the guaranteed minimum income. And I'm just curious if that squares with the speaker's understanding. And uh, then the second question, and I run the risk of being a watermelon guy for this, and that is, and then the same idea, when the market fails, government steps in. Uh, just referring to the remarks of the professor on conservation, what does he think about the commons, pro what would Hayek think about the commons problem, external costs, the need for government to, you know, say impose gasoline taxes, that sort of thing. Thank you very much. I think that Hayek did have the <clears throat> he, he certainly said throughout his works that uh, in an advanced industrial society, government should provide a social minimum. And that's why, as I indicated, it's his, not so much his practical policy advice that's often valued by uh, conservative economic and libertarian-oriented writers, but his philosophical thought uh, so cannot be denied. Now, he would say that he'd like to see less government rather than more, more market provision of, 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 of welfare services, but nonetheless, he did sanction that role of government. In regard to the environment as well, uh, these are difficult areas in which it's hard to enunciate principles in terms of whether it's air pollution or whatever the, uh, the situation might be. And I don't think that Hayek's contributions in these areas were as significant as his contributions in more uh, philosophical areas. Right. Uh, let me follow up on that. Um, as, as Alan points out in his book, uh, the early Hayek had uh, a, a larger list of things that he thought that was appropriate for government to do than the older Hayek. 
Well, he was originally a socialist. Too. Well, even when, even when, yeah. he, even after the road to serfdom. Right. Um, uh, Adam Smith. Uh, by the way, that's not the Smith Center. Doesn't refer to Adam Smith. It refers to, although I'd be happy with that association. It refers to uh, Owen and Irma Smith from Castor Valley, who were the ones that endowed the center at the university. Uh, but Adam Smith himself had a, a rather extensive list of, of uh, appropriate, what he thought would be appropriate government functions. And the early Hayek, I think, would have uh, seemed to agree with practically all of that list. Well, as, as, as technology evolves, the, the things that are necessary for government to do, especially with regard to the environment, get less and less and less. Because the problem with, with uh, uh, the externality problem, the environmental problems, the problems of the commons, to use the, the questioner's uh, language, have to do with the, the, the ability to define and enforce exchangeable property rights. And uh, technology is evolving now, which, which is greatly shrinking that set of things where it is, it is difficult, i.e. very costly, to enforce uh, exchangeable private property rights. For example, there's a tagging technology now that you can use to uh, keep track of migrating animals, uh, even in the sea. Or, uh, 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 of course, you can do that on the land very easily. So uh, Hayek, Hayek did subscribe to a, a rather substantial list, uh, a list that's longer than my list, of a legitimate government. I'm not an anarchist, by the way. Uh, Murray Rothbard, whom many of you know about, was, uh, referred to himself as an anarcho-capitalist. He was a great friend of mine. Uh, uh, I broke bread with him and his wife, uh, Joey, many times, uh, and he always very laughingly called me a minarchist. You know? <laughs> I'm not an anarchist, I'm a minarchist, because I, I had some, there were some legitimate things for government to do. Uh, but, uh, uh, see, I, don't, I didn't agree with uh, Murray on that. I, uh, and, and Hayek didn't, and even Mises didn't. Even Mises didn't. Rothbard called himself a Misesian. Uh, as a matter of fact, he, he was, uh, there's, a, there's an organization at uh, Auburn University called the Mises Institute. And Rothbard was very closely associated with that uh, uh, before his untimely death. Uh, and uh, Murray sometimes came across as, uh, as saying that whatever is in Mises is okay and whatever isn't in Mises is not okay. As a matter of fact, in a couple of times Murray even went to attack Hayek because Hayek was insufficiently Misesian. Uh, so, so I'm more with Hayek than I am uh, with Rothbard on this issue. There are legitimate things for government to do. For example, enforce the rules of voluntary exchange. You know, Hayek referred to, uh, as Alan says in his book, he referred often to the, the thing called, what he liked to refer to as the universal rules of just conduct. Well, if you look at what he, t what he meant by the universal rules of just conduct, those are just the rules of voluntary exchange. When we talk about the role of government, in enfor enforcing, having any role at all in, in interpersonal uh, interaction, uh, it is merely, according to Hayek, at least the later Hayek, to enforce those rules of voluntary exchange. So Hayek grew, improved, I think, uh, with age uh, on this topic. One other thing I might mention in reference to the, the two-part question he had is, is that, as Chuck is suggesting, over time Hayek did begin to see the implications of his thinking as you'd apply it to more and more specific things and where he didn't and where there might have been, in other words, his views on certain government programs were in many respects not never driven from his views. But uh, many other scholars have now applied his analysis and one of those areas is the environment. In fact, you might even say that where you have a commons problem, it's because property rights are not being recognized and enforced right. and hence you have the free rider effects and externality problems. How about right. right here in front? Just wait for that microphone. The uh, Austrian School of Economics has sort of competed with the Chicago School for the better part of a half century. Um, and certainly the Chicago School under the auspices of Milton Friedman have enjoyed greater success, uh, at least in terms of how they're received by the general public. Most people have never heard of an Austrian. Um, and it seems to me that one of the biggest problems Austrians face is 
articulating a policy difference be from from what the uh, the Chicago school does. There are some um, antitrust issues, and I think that that they there is also a a a, a money uh, Federal Reserve question out there. But for some reason, those the uh, certainly the Federal Reserve has never caught on, and I'm wondering if there's something that Austrians need to do to better express that, and whether or not there are other policy areas that uh, the Austrians need to pursue further. Um, uh, Alan has, has asked me to reply first. Uh, um, I don't think there are very many differences between the Chicago School and the Austrian School when it comes to policy. The one exception that I know of <clears throat> has to do with money. You know, Hayek and Friedman were both co-founders of the Mont Pelerin Society. And for many, many years, at every meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society, one of the main questions up for debate was, who's right? Right? Mises, uh, Mises and Hayek or Friedman, you know, the monetarists. And they have, they have substantial uh, disagreements uh, on that point. Uh, uh, they have substantial disagreements on the question of methodology of economics. Uh, Friedman being a, a positivist, he wrote that famous, I think it was in 1952, uh, uh, the, the, the methodology of positive economics. And, uh, and essay on positive. Uh, an essay. An essay on positive economics. And, um, and, uh, and Friedman has said, in fact, as Alan sa uh, quotes in his book, Friedman has, says, has said that, the, that uh, he, likes, uh, he likes the work of uh, Hayek much better when it comes to philosophy and, 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 um, and uh, social, uh, social questions than he does in economics. But when it comes to policy, except for the Fed, except for monetary policy, they agree on antitrust. I mean, you take the book that the Independent Institute did on the, uh, on the uh, Microsoft case uh, by Stephen Margolis and Stan Leibowitz. And Stan Leibowitz. Um, the arguments that they're making in there could have been made by Hayek or Friedman. Hayek and Friedman both would have agreed with them, Friedman, all of them. Friedman's used to them. Yeah. So I don't think there's any, any uh, policy disagreement except for this quirky thing on money. And, 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 and to put that into context, uh, as Alan says in his book, Hayek became the Took Professor of Economics, or Political Economy, I guess it was, Political Economy at the London School of Economics in 1931, on the basis of some lectures that he gave as a visitor there, which were published as uh, Prices in Production, uh, <clears throat> wherein he, 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 he talked about what he called the structure of production, and um, and uh, he talked about what now is known as the Austrian monetary theory uh, of the trade cycle. Uh, Hayek never, as Alan says in the book, Hayek never gave up on that. Hayek always insisted on that, sometimes contrary to what seemed to be obvious uh, uh, empirical uh, contradictions of it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and Friedman never, uh, Friedman always always differentiated himself from Hayek on that, always said that Hayek was wrong. Uh, but um, uh, Friedman has said, Friedman has said that the Federal Reserve should be replaced by a Pentium chip, yeah. right? Because he, he said, the Fed, because discretionary monetary policy makes a mess of things. He would agree with Hayek on that, right? Discretionary policy makes a mess of, mess of things. And so that ought to be a, a rule that increases the money supply at some given level consistent with the level of real economic growth. Hayek, uh, right, at the, right at the, uh, toward the end of his life, wrote this, this book, uh, actually it was a monograph for the Institute for, uh, of Economic Affairs, called The Denationalization of Money. So he too would like to see the Fed replaced. Well, in Hayek's case with private money and with uh, uh, Friedman's case, the uh, Pentium chip. So there's not all that much disagreement. Actually, Friedman uh, later endorsed Hayek's, uh, not specific of the proposal in the denationalization of money book, but the idea of non-state monetary systems. Yeah. Um, let's see. Are you on the front, Carl? Uh, my question is for Alan. Uh, concerning the uh, infinite fragmentization of ideas throughout the human race, 
In the last generation, the electron has come in millions of instances to the possession of individuals. And the uh, communications that are, are uh, available today and becoming more and more available will have a great deal, great considerable effect on this fragmentization. Would you care to speculate on what you think will come? Sure. Well, you know, what do they say? Um, uh, fools rush in where you know angels are fear to tread, or something like that. So that's always been my experience. The um, <laughs> I think that the um, <clears throat> I think that the ability for information to uh, be communicated increases possibilities for centralization. Uh, you saw this in the late 19th century that when the telegraph and um, other means of communication like that uh, came into existence, that suddenly it was possible to create large corporations and to um, <clears throat> those who were first into these new systems of knowledge or new systems of information communication were able to take advantage of greater resource uh, manipulation that had not previously ex happened. And I think that we're experiencing a period somewhat like that now as a result of the internet revolution that it's not that <clears throat> someone like Bill Gates is so much more effective if he'd come along in 1950s that he'd be worth $70 billion in those equivalent, equivalent terms. I think it's that it's a unique situation that when technologies for greater information communication uh, are developed, that that for a time is going to whoever, whenever new opportunities exist, there are going to be leaders in that field who take advantage of those opportunities. That leads to larger units of organization for a time, potentially decades. But then I think that after a period of time, those advantages uh, have a tendency to uh, even out, and there's a more, uh, there isn't quite the same degree of um, uh, hierarchical patterns. That's relatively inarticulate, but for speculation, I guess that's as good as I could do. Now, could, I, could I comment on that? Yeah. Uh, just, just a couple of uh, points. <clears throat> uh, lowering the cost of communication, I think, was very important in bringing down the, the Iron Curtain. Uh, <clears throat> when, there was, uh, when there was an attempt to, uh, to have a military coup to reinstall uh, Stalinist-type government in the Soviet Union. It didn't work. And why didn't it work? It's because the information was coming over fax machines to all over the world what was going on. Secondly, I would say, consider the phenomenon of, of homeschooling. Uh, the, the low cost of information and communication now has made possible this fantastic phenomenon. There's an article in, in, the, in the May issue of uh, uh, Ideas on Liberty uh, which is an excellent article, I commend it to you, on a renaissance in education. And the author, who is one of the vice presidents of AOL.com, uh, uh, points out that everything that the public school establishment has in terms of, of activities for students, uh, orchestras, uh, plays, field trips, uh, everything, Everything is available to homeschoolers now because of the internet. It has greatly reduced the costs of people coming together. As a matter of fact, it's, 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 homeschooling, I think, is a great example, a great contemporary example of Hayek's spontaneous order. I mean, who would have thought, five years ago even, that, this, that, this, that homeschooling would become so... Uh, significant now, so large as it is, and it's growing, it's growing fast, and, and it's working, it's working very well. Uh, so I, just as a little counterbalance, I think that the lowering of uh, uh, information uh, costs is a boon to liberty. It's, it's not a problem. One thing also, for those of you who were not at our event last month, which was on uh, high technology and privacy and encryption, this was a major part of the discussion. That um, program will be on our website, I think, within a few days. So if you're interested in exploring that issue, it's discussed in more detail. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. How about back here? You and then Peter. Hayek and the other liberals have taught us great lessons about uh, essentially two results or two 
uh, polar opposite, if you will, uh, statist and liberal societies, which we prefer and why. And I think it's a great thing that we can cel celebrate uh, that Hayek lived long enough to see the decline of the evil empire, and I agree that information did a lot on that. But at the same time, Manker Olson mm -hmm. taught us mm -hmm. another lesson, which is within a free society, within a mixed economy, there is this accumulation of social, political, economic barnacles on the whole of society. And it's a seems to be a one-way process. And I guess I'm interested in your reaction to that as an underlying counter trend and whether there's anything that Hayek and the liberals have to say about how we avoid, how we counter that erosion, uh, in not just choosing between statism and liberalism, but how do we uh, combat, how do we react to the accumulist, uh, accumulation of status tendencies? Sure. You know, I, I think that, and this goes to, to some extent, questions of epistemology, which <clears throat> for those who may not be entirely familiar with that term means theory of knowledge. And <clears throat> I think Hayek really talked a lot, um, he thought a lot about, um, as I've seen in some of his, his work, unpublished work at the Hoover Institute archives, and it is to some extent in, in, in some of his published articles as well, on the idea that not all knowledge can be articulated and that there is a difference between <clears throat> verbal rules and, for example, just the practices that people have, and that words like liberalism and statism, to some extent, aren't oh, material, tangible, absolutes in the same sense that matter is. So what we're really talking about is ways of looking at the world in terms of is it better to have societies in which decisions are made by everybody, statism, or to have societies in which decisions are made by individuals. Um, and I think that um, it's something that I, I agree entirely with Chuck. I, I think that the direction that things are moving is that there is more individual freedom and autonomy now that technology allows that. And uh, it's something that regardless of the terminology, I think that the Hayek used to say that uh, in the 60s and 70s that if the politicians didn't blow everything up in, in 20 years that he thought things would be okay. By, by the 80s he started to say, well, if they haven't blown it up in another 10 years, they'll be okay. And let's face it, the Soviet Union has collapsed. The idea that government runs an economy better is, is dead around the world. And to be sure, the, you know, it always resurfaces in other modes, environmentalism, and, and, and local plan, I mean, local planning controls and so forth. But I, I think that the overall direction at this point in time for the foreseeable future is, I mean, if you read the literature from the 40s and 50s, just the, the periodical literature of the day, it's astonishing. People will talk about if people are businessmen, and I mean, this is not, I'm not over exaggerating. If people are businessmen, perhaps they have a psychological disorder because <laughs> they want to make a profit or something like that, or have a, a need to domineer. And, and this is the sort of stuff. Now, some of that's still in the acad in, in academia, but the point is, is that there has been just especially a, in academia. especially, it, it's, especially it's, it's, <laughs> there's been a revolution. And um, it's something that I don't think the revolution is consolidated and it's always got to be fought for, but. I think that notwithstanding the the issues that government will always be inefficient, it is the most interesting statistic is that under the current admi administration in Washington's budgets, the, if, if all came to pass in another 10 years, the federal spending share of GNP would be down to 15.6%. So, I mean, the point is, I think that whether that goal is met is another question, but um, it's something that, uh, uh, although I hope it would be, um, I think it's something that the, I'm optimistic. Uh, uh, just two points on that question. Uh, first of all, I firmly believe that there is no legitimate third way, that the choice is between socialism or liberalism, classical liberalism, freedom. And there is no third way. With regard to uh, Mansur Olson, uh, and I, I, I admire, I mean, he was one of the, uh, James Buchanan credits Mansur Olson as, as being one of the inspirations for the development of uh, public choice theory. 
And so he's a, he's a very important person. Now, his, his notion of barnacles and all, and all of that had to do with the formation of special interest groups. Uh, and he talked about how when there's a, when there's a war, uh, a lot of those uh, special interest groups just get smashed up. And so that right after the war, there's a chance to really make some progress. Now, a lot of people accused him of advocating war because of that. <laughs> I, I don't think he's guilty of that. But you, my, my view about special interest groups is, is probably utopian. <clears throat> Why did dairy interests uh, give lots of money to Richard Nixon in his uh, uh, re-election campaign? Very simple. If Richard, if Richard Nixon or any other president had nothing to do with dairy prices, had no power over, over anything in the dairy industry, nobody would have given him a dime. The problem was not Nixon, and the problem was not the people that tried to bribe Nixon. The problem was the fact that in this political economy, Nixon had power. And wherever there's power, there's going to be special interest groups coming together to try to exploit the power. So the only cure to special interest groups, short of war, uh, <laughs> is, 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 is to reduce the power that the politicians have to sell. <laughs> um, in, your, in your book, you talk about how Road to Serfdom was published to wide acclaim. And yet, uh, for at least 40 years after it was published, in England at least, collectivism was the order of the day. And when I was at Oxford in the 1960s, I, was never, I never even heard the name Hayek. I mean, he, never was, he wasn't even in the curriculum. And my question is, did Hayek himself had any, have any explanation for why his ideas took so long to be noticed in the sense of being incorporated in, in public policy? That, that's a really good question, Peter. Um, in 1970, <laughs> Arthur Selden visited Hayek in Salzburg, and uh, Hayek was so depressed at that point in time that it, he thought his career had been a waste. No one had listened to what he had said, that his writings at that point in time were completely unread, and uh, that he'd had no influence whatsoever. Um, so. That's what the circumstance was. I, I think that <clears throat> what happened was that, uh, and this would be to some extent Hayek's answer, is that as a result of inflation uh, and uh, problems perceived of an increasing government role, that his ideas suddenly became relevant in a way that had not been relevant before so that it was more the larger circumstances that led to the, re the relevance of his ideas rather than uh, his ideas themselves sparking the, uh, the change that he had hoped for. Um, so I, th I think that's fair. I think that's fair. There's, there's a no Margaret Thatcher espoused his ideas? And, and then in the 80s, Margaret Thatcher truly embraced him and would invite him to events and all that sort of thing. So. There's, a, there's another theory that... Uh, actually, Selden also talked to uh, Hayek about, and other people have asked Hayek about this, was when Keynes wrote his book, The General Theory, mm. <clears throat> Hayek had just refuted Keynes' previous book in a review. And so when The General Theory came up, um, Hayek assumed it was basically just rehashing the previous work, and he just, just didn't even pay attention to it and didn't want to be bothered by it. And uh, so the view that was assumed pretty much, of course, there was a lot of political pressures to, for state planning to be used by different groups for their own purposes, but a lot of people assumed that if Hayek didn't think it was important, that, well, maybe it was okay, maybe there's nothing wrong with it. And so there's a theory that if Hayek had <clears throat> looked at the general theory and refuted it because of his very powerful position at the London School of Economics, it may have stopped Keynes in his tracks and changed the course of economic thought. <clears throat> One other thing I might mention is that, and Alan mentions this in his book, the Friedmans talk about a so-called Hayek tide. Yeah. Uh, it's sometimes called the Hayek wave also. And the Hayek tide was the idea that at the point of the publication of The Road to Serfdom, <clears throat> which again was dedicated to the, social, to the socialists of all parties, it was sort of a nodal point in intellectual history. And it created this new wave for people to reconsider fundamental views. And the wave has been washing on 
shore after shore, decade after decade, in different circumstances, creating other waves in the same, same way. So there's these paradigms that exist that will continue unchallenged in many respects, unless circumstances change, as Alan is saying, and also there's an intellectual basis for an alternative. So um, I think we're all over time, but I want to thank everyone for joining with us. I want, to, I want to particularly thank Alan for his excellent work. It took many years for him to produce this book. Um, and it's, it's serving as a great catalyst for other people to be interested in Hayek. I want to thank Chuck for not just um, his great talk, but for Chuck's work for years and years in a similar vein and all that the Smith Center is doing. And thank you for joining with us. There are copies of the book for those of you who don't have copies. Uh, Alan would be delighted to uh, autograph copies up until the point he has to run to the airport. So thank you for coming. Thank you.